Sometimes when I'm researching other cases that I'm working on, I come across some really strange and crazy cases that aren't really long enough to be their own video, but I can't just not mention. So every once in a while I decide to combine a bunch of these into one video. So sit back and enjoy some of the five most recent crazy cases I've come across. This week, Yours App has been great enough to collaborate with me on this video. Yours App is a self-care app designed to, well, help you take care of yourself in all sorts of ways. You've got everything from specially developed meditation rituals, to yoga practices, to even soundscapes, and a lot more, including sleep stories to listen to. Which is something that I'm sure you'll probably like if you enjoy videos like mine. There are all sorts of stories on here, as well as music and even other things that can help you to relax. One really cool section of the app is the psychology section. It's full of short, bite-sized, easily digestible psychology tips from well-established psychologists in the UK. There are tips on everything from dealing with stress, to building relationships, to getting back to life after isolation. The whole aim is to give you a place where you can relax and take care of yourself, even improve yourself. I'd say that one of the coolest things about Yours app is that it's all personalized to your own tastes. You don't have to go search through a bunch of video or audio files on YouTube only to come up with nothing. Not only does it save you time, but you'll end up with a lot more in the end anyway. All you have to really do is take about five minutes out of your day to be mindful, with Yours app acting as your own personal assistant to guide you and help you out. So go to yoursapp.com slash dire to get a huge 60% off discount from the yearly Yours app subscription, or sign up using the code dire, all caps. Signing up for the app directly supports this channel as well. A 49-year-old woman named Rebecca Lynette caused quite a scene at a Walmart in Crockett, Texas back in January. The police were called when she approached another woman at the self-checkout and offered to, well, buy her baby. The mother, who we'll call mom just for the sake of simplicity here, was in a self-checkout line at Walmart just hoping to get her items and get out of there. She had a cart full of items in front of her, her child, and one other item she brought with her that day. Her other child. This other child was a one-year-old baby who was sitting in that top part of the cart the kids sit in. That was when a woman that she had never seen before, Rebecca Taylor herself, approached her and began complimenting her baby, namely the baby's blonde hair and blue eyes. She then abruptly and unexpectedly asked how much she could purchase him for. The mom laughed at the question, thinking that it must have been a joke, but Rebecca kept a stone-cold, serious expression. She further asserted that she wasn't playing around, she wanted to purchase the child. She insisted that she had $250,000 out in her car for some reason, and she was willing to pay it all for this baby. The mom responded saying that she wasn't going to haggle this, no amount of money was worth her child. Rebecca didn't give up, continuing to push despite giving a flat no as an answer. The mom told her to kindly back the fuck up and get away from her baby. Rebecca adamantly refused, however, clarifying that she has been wanting to purchase a baby for quite some time now, as if that helps matters. The mom noted that Rebecca was with another woman who hadn't spoken up too much. However, when the second woman finally did speak up, all she did was ask what the son's name was. The mom refused to provide her with this information. But, creepily enough, both Rebecca and the second woman started calling the son by his correct name, without the mom ever telling them what it was, and without his name being clearly visible on anything they were carrying. The mom made her purchase and started booking it out to the parking lot to get in her car and bail on this whole creepy situation. But, Rebecca and her friend followed her out into the parking lot. It was then that they started offering her even more money for the child. Once in the parking lot, Taylor began screaming, saying that if I wouldn't take $250,000 for him, then she would give me $500,000 because she wanted him and she was going to take him, said the mom in a later statement. The mom quickly threw both of her kids into the car and locked the doors, while Rebecca stood behind the car and continued to demand the baby. She kept offering the five hundred dollars screaming about it in front of everyone until she finally gave up. She entered a black SUV near the mom's car and fled the scene. The mom understandably freaked out and called the police. The police showed up and checked the surveillance footage at the Walmart, which confirmed that the story had went down pretty much just as the mom had told them. 
Lieutenant Aaliyah Price with the Crockett Police Department was on patrol when she got the phone call from the mom and heard the crazy story. The police were able to track down Rebecca and went to her home to speak to her. Taylor said that he was the perfect fit and she had been wanting to buy a baby for a long time now. She told me that she doesn't like thieves and then she stated that I could speak with her attorney and to get off her precipice. She slammed the door shut, said Lieutenant Price. Price was quickly able to secure an arrest warrant for Rebecca that she was able to serve up just a couple of days later. She was taken into custody on January 18th, and her charge was one that I honestly didn't even know existed. A third degree felony, purchase of a child. I, I guess it's honestly just never come up before. According to the Texas Penal Code, that crime can carry a sentence of anywhere between two to 10 years. In addition, it can include a fine of up to $10,000. If Rebecca was telling the truth early on, then that fine shouldn't put a dent in her finances. Her bond was set for $50,000, which she was able to pay, and she was bonded out of the Houston County Jail on January 20th. She currently denies the whole thing, by the way. Did you actually try to buy a child? No, I didn't. I walked in, I bought some potty pads for my micro Pomeranians, and I walked out, and somehow this happened. I'm just gonna put myself in the loving arms of uh, Dick DeGuerre and he'll take care of it. I can't believe that people can just make something up and then all of a sudden charge you with the felony. And there, there will be repercussions. That's all I have to say. So I guess we'll just see where this goes. I mean, stick with the channel and who knows. And here we go with a Florida case, so you know this one's gonna be good. A teenager in Florida was arrested after he was accused of tracking and following a local jogger who regularly passed his home in hopes of ending his life and keeping his body in the closet, quote, to play with. The teenager, an 18-year-old man named Logan Smith, was arrested, also in January, on one account of attempted murder after he ambushed the jogger near his home and tried to strangle him, according to arrest reports. About a week before he was arrested, Logan began collecting an arsenal of what he calls weapons. These included a can of Axe deodorant spray, a belt from a robe, and a rubber mallet. Not exactly a top-notch loadout, but he was determined to make it work. On the day of the attack, he left his home and walked across the street, where he hid behind a light pole. He laid the can of Axe and the rubber mallet down by his feet while he sat in wait, ready to pounce on his victim. As usual, the jogger started coming down the sidewalk on his normal path. Logan waited for him to pass, and when he did, he took off running after him. Logan then wrapped the belt from the robe around the victim, aiming for his neck, but kind of missing the mark and wrapping it around his head instead. After a struggle, he eventually got it down to his neck, but it didn't do much. But little did Logan know, his victim was pretty proficient in martial arts. The victim quickly turned the tables and whooped his sorry ass, according to investigators. The jogger then held Logan down until police arrived. After the arrest, the police proceeded to interview Logan. He told them that he had been monitoring the jogger's routine for weeks at this point, maybe even months. And then after watching the movie Scream, he decided that he would kill the jogger. He didn't really elaborate on this. He had intended to use the can of Axe as a sort of pepper spray, he added, but it never got to that point. After killing the jogger, he said, he planned to keep him in his bedroom closet where he would, uh, have him all to himself. He intended to use this opportunity to fulfill his darkest, nastiest fantasies that I, I don't really need to go into. I feel like you can kind of fill in the gaps. But uh, luckily, he didn't get to do that. Logan Smith was locked up and held without bond. It appeared at the time that he didn't have a lawyer. Logan actually already had a boyfriend, surprisingly, and it seemed he was very close with his family. The boyfriend's mother spoke to both police and local news about him, in shock of all that had happened. One of Logan's reported father figures, who refused to be identified for understandable reasons, said, He wouldn't have been the kind of kid that you invited to cool parties. We just thought it was odd that he wanted to go out to the movies by himself. A person like Logan is more of a loner. They don't like to go out of their comfort zone, he added. We are all at a loss for this. I, 
it's hard to wrap your mind around the thoughts that were going through his head and what he wanted to do. He noted that Logan had been struggling with, well, pretty much everything since his dad had died in a car accident five years prior. And he tells me he would like that victim to know he's terribly sorry for what happened to him and actually wanted to thank him for stopping things before they got out of hand. So the family of this father figure decided to get a lawyer and help him out all that they could. And I guess we'll have to wait and see where this one goes too. So lightening up the mood a bit with something not quite as dark, we do have another case from the lovely land of Florida. Out in Seminole County, a newlywed bride and a wedding caterer were arrested after tainting the wedding food with certain substances and making a whole lot of people very sick. On February 19th, some deputies were called out to Springs Clubhouse in Longwood after a guest attending the wedding started feeling what he said to be weird. It, it feel like I feel weird. I, 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 I feel like there's some kind of drugs in me or something, and I don't know what's happening. The guest said that he felt like he had, quote, drugs inside him after partaking in some of the food in the wedding. I started feeling very weird, like I'm losing track of time, time's dilating, my, my heart rate feels pretty high, I feel like I'm going in and out. The first responders on the scene started treating a bunch of people who were complaining of severe stomach cramps and vomiting. This was when they were approached by one guest who clearly informed them that the wedding food had been laced with marijuana. Apparently a, a lot of marijuana. Yet another guest reported that she felt like her heart was going to give out after eating the bread and olive oil that was served to her. She was so thoroughly convinced that she was going to die that she went to her car and drafted up a final message on her phone so that people would know what had happened to her. Another woman at the wedding became so extremely paranoid that she suddenly felt that her husband was keeping some very dark family secrets from her, believing that her son-in-law had somehow died and that her family was hiding that fact from her. She reported to deputies that she remembered seeing the caterer put the food out and then cover it with a green substance from a bowl into little dishes that she soon filled with olive oil. It was mixed with spices to the point where it no longer really tasted like marijuana at all, and this particular guest just thought it was some kind of herb. That was until she ate it and was blasted out of her mind. She headed out onto the dance floor and asked the bride if she had put marijuana into the olive oil. The bride smiled, acting as if she had done her a service, and said, Yes. Around this time, two other guests went into the kitchen at the reception, hoping to get some water, and told the staff they weren't feeling very well. Well, there's cannabis in the food, they were told. Deputies spoke with a woman on the scene, asking if she had consented to or requested that the food be laced with marijuana. The report states that she stared at the deputy with a blank expression for quite a while before saying, No. They then tried to locate the caterer, but she had left. A bunch of samples were taken, including of glassware and food like chocolate-covered strawberries, pudding, and lasagna, which is a gross combination. Another guest said that he was feeling both ill and high, according to reports. He already had it in his head that he wanted to press charges against anyone who laced his food with any kind of drugs against his will. He was taken to the hospital along with many others. In fact, a good portion of the 50 guests in attendance were shipped off to South Seminole Hospital. They were given urine and lab tests that quickly confirmed that they were indeed served marijuana, and further lab tests on the wedding lasagna confirmed that it was indeed laced up. Both the new bride, Dana Svoboda, age 42, and the caterer, Jocelyn Bryant, age 31, were arrested for the act. They were facing charges of tampering, culpable negligence, and delivery of marijuana. The police said that the bride had agreed to and allowed Jocelyn Bryant to lace the food she served with cannabis, unbeknownst to the attendees, many of whom became very ill and required medical attention. Jocelyn was from a catering company called Jocelyn's Southern Kitchen, who apparently has some pretty lax rules of operation. A motive was never really given for this incident. I guess they just thought it would be funny. Both the charges of food tampering and delivery of marijuana are felonies, and negligence is a misdemeanor. The bride and the caterer were later charged with food tampering, delivery of marijuana, and negligence. 
Food tampering and delivery of marijuana are both felonies, while negligence is a misdemeanor. On a similar note to that last case, let's head over to Stafford County, Virginia, where a bunch of babies got super high at daycare. On March 2nd, several babies were taken to the emergency room after their parents picked them up from daycare. The parents noticed that they were behaving very oddly to the point where they thought something might seriously be wrong with them. All three of the babies, each about one year old, were in the emergency room after their symptoms, mainly lethargy and loss of coordination with glassy and bloodshot eyes, worried hospital staff. Several members of the hospital staff recognized the symptoms and gave each of the babies drug tests. It was soon confirmed that all of them tested positive for THC, which I'm sure you know is the psychoactive compound in weed. Police were then understandably called out to the Stafford Hospital Center after it was found that a bunch of babies had been drugged. The connection was pretty quickly made. All of these babies had attended the same daycare provider, a licensed home daycare out in the Windsor Forest subdivision. Detectives went out and searched the home daycare where they soon found and collected a bunch of goldfish crackers around the high chairs that the toddlers had used. Just listen to how this news reporter emphasizes high chairs. A detective found the lace goldfish crackers around their high chairs. The goldfish were shipped off to a lab and tested where it was soon confirmed that, yes indeed, they were the source of the THC. Child Protective Services were called out and soon got involved in the case. The daycare then surrendered their license voluntarily. After the investigation, the 60-year-old daycare owner, Rebecca Swanner, turned herself in to the police. She was then given three charges of cruelty and injury to children, which is a felony that is punishable by up to five years in prison, according to state law. She was released on a $2,000 bond. Luckily, all the kids are doing fine now, with seemingly no lasting complications. It still isn't known if the owner gave the crackers to the kids on purpose or on accident. Safe to say that by this point, if she still hasn't said anything about it, she's probably not going to. Now let's head over to Austintown, Ohio, where a Youngstown State University student was picked up in a police sting. Just check out the headline. College student arrested, tried to trade chicken Alfredo, Sprite, for sex. The student, a 22-year-old man named Albert Maruna, was caught and arrested after he attempted to have, let's say, relations with a 15-year-old boy that he met online. Little did he know that, Chris Hansen style, this boy was really an undercover cop. Albert began conversing with the undercover cop back in December, responding to a post on a dating app, according to the police report. The cop clearly told Albert that he was 15, but Albert was perfectly fine with this. He told the cop that he didn't believe in age. It didn't take long before the conversations took a dirtier turn. It was pretty immediate, in fact. Albert then soon started sending nudes to the police officer. He then later told the officer that he was starting to develop feelings for him, which seems a bit out of order, and told him, you are my one and only, even adding that he hoped to be his husband one day. Then he offered to set up a time and place for them to meet, sweetening the deal by saying that he'd bring the boy some chicken Alfredo and Sprite. Oh, and some lube. He further insisted that the boy wear a jock strap. I don't know why. Albert then traveled out to Austin Town, where he believed the boy was, and he was promptly arrested. When he was arrested, he was carrying an iPhone, a MacBook, three flash drives, the previously mentioned bottle of lube, two bottles of Sprite, and some chicken Alfredo in a Tupperware. Classy. He was being held in the Mahoning County Jail, charged with attempted unlawful contact with a minor, disseminating matter harmful to juveniles, possessing criminal tools, and importuning. During questioning, Albert clearly stated that he did not feel that getting with a 15-year-old was wrong. He ended up getting served a seven-day jail sentence, along with having to register as an S offender and go through 120 days of house arrest. So, once again, thank you for watching my video. I hope you don't mind the lighter tone in this one. A lot of these crimes, uh, nobody died, which is, you know, out of the ordinary for this channel. If you don't mind giving the video a like, it really does help with the algorithm, and subscribe if you want to see more stuff like this. I do these collections every now and then. 
If you want to help out the channel even further, I do have a Patreon account, which I keep linked in the description below, and on there you can see the episodes both early, uncensored, oh, and even ad-free. So, uh, speaking of which, shout out to the top patrons. We have Marsh Kaleido, AMCMT, Balls, Rick Torres, Farius, Tang, Sash Johnson, Marianne McCurdy, Wafrans, Jules Latona, Arctic Cat, Alan Damiani, Adrian Lawley, Marsh, Buffazerk, Rinsenstein, Kim Peek, Lux Alpaca, Charity, Skooky Maine, Jackie, Tracer Ferguson, and Mark Barnett. You people are good people. Very good people. So, thank you, and good night. She entered a black US USB. She entered a black SUV in either mom's